I'm the son of refugees, Vietnamese refugees. I was born and raised in California. For the longest time, I always imagined myself working in Asia. One time, in between switching jobs, I went to Vietnam on holiday, discovered how exciting Vietnam could really be. That was about three and a half years ago, and I've been in Vietnam ever since. When I was given the opportunity to bring Vietnam to the world, that was almost too good to pass up. Vietnam is one of those last markets in Southeast Asia that haven't been disrupted, that haven't been um, properly invested into yet. Most people still considered a backwater, a frontier market, and I think that's where the opportunity lies. We have made four angel personal investments. One of those is a restaurant I started with a chef. He's also Vietnamese American. I actually almost emptied my life savings to open that restaurant. I don't know why I did that, but I did. And I was working on it with him for about a year, year and a half. And I made a decent chunk of money from that after I sold it. Right now I'm kind of sitting on the, the sidelines observing what's going on within that space, just trying to look at ways to reinvest. họ sẽ rang xây bằng những cái cối xây trụ như vậy á. Cà phê cái này xong rồi mà tại sao cô đỏ bỏ bỏ cơm rượu á? Như là ngoài cái bơ mà trong cái hũ đỏ đỏ họ bỏ vào, họ bỏ thêm cái rượu là cái giai đoạn cuối cùng luôn. Một ly cà phê ở đây á, à, bạn bao nhiêu? À, một ly rất là rẻ là chỉ có 15 ngàn Mà anh có Instagram về blog Việt Nam cho đồ ăn đó, về bụng đó Dạ đúng Mọi người trẻ lớn hơn cả bạn bè mà ai follow anh Thì là hiện tại cái có hai độ tuổi đang follow anh nhiều nhất là từ 18 tới 24 và từ 24 tới 35 tuổi và trong đó thì chiếm tầm 75 phần trăm sẽ là các bạn phụ nữ một phần trăm còn lại sẽ là đàn ông còn ten mà ví dụ như là đồ ăn hẹp đường phố những món thuộc về cái khu chợ lớn người hoa của mình thì sẽ được rất là nhiều người yêu thích và họ like còn thường mà đăng những quán mà sang trọng thì nội thường họ sẽ không thích lắm user Việt Nam sẽ hướng đến những cái quán lề đường mà kiểu thân thuộc với họ hơn. Mà anh sẽ nghĩ đồ ăn Việt Nam á, ở đường phố á, có nhiều người Việt Nam muốn ăn, mà Việt Nam có những đồ ăn bởi quốc tế đúng không? Mà suy nghĩ đồ ăn quốc tế á, popular hơn á, về người trẻ kiểu là những đồ ăn mà của nước ngoài du nhập vào á thì sẽ bao lợi với người trẻ nhưng mà chỉ được một cái thời gian đầu thôi nghĩa là đồ ăn đường phố việt nam là sẽ có màu sắc có hương vị cho nên là dù những cái brand mới có gia nhập vô thị trường việt nam nhưng mà vẫn không thể sánh bằng những cái một cái là truyền thống mà sắp tới là mình cái chuyện với anh tới là mình sẽ đi ăn ốc ốc mà 
ăn uh, ở bên uh, biển ngon hơn đó. cũng tùy ví dụ như là cũng mình cũng đi ra biển nhưng mà ốc có thể tươi hơn nhưng mà họ lại không cái cái chế biến có thể là không ngon bằng so với sài gòn nên sài gòn họ có những cái công thức chế biến đặc biệt để mà ra được cái hương vị ốc rất là ngon tôi ở đây hai người Dạ có, một nguyên hấp xạ Dạ Dạ Có có người trẻ ăn cái này không? Very much <cười> Nhiều lắm á Dạ à. người, à, người trẻ mà thích ăn cái này Mà thích ăn cái này nhiều hơn McDonald's không? Mình nghĩ là nhiều hơn nhiều hơn Vì giống như là cái này sẽ là nhiều gia vị hơn, thơm ngon hơn ừ. Còn McDonald's thì cũng giống như những cái nhà hàng fast food khác là ừ. Chỉ có hamburger, rồi gà rán á Thì là có thể là họ sẽ ăn trong những ngày mà họ không biết gì ăn đấy gì Nhưng mà những cái món ốc như thế này họ vẫn ưa chuộng hơn Fast food Như lại fast food thì ăn sẽ mập hơn, ăn những này rất là nhiều The fast food industry has become very saturated, but the local food and beverage scene has been one of the fastest growing areas in Vietnam. of the Vietnamese consumer to spend money on, on eating out and food and beverage products is huge. What kind of investors are you seeing coming to Vietnam in that space? For the last Five, ten years, the two biggest investors into Vietnam have always been Japan and Korea. Their demographics are making it hard for them to invest domestically in their own countries because of their aging populations. They're looking to access what's a very fast-growing middle class. It has a large population of around 95 million. It's also a young population as well. Vietnam's demographics are very favorable to foreign investment. How would you say that the environment is for uh, foreign investments to come in here? Uh, Vietnam's done a lot in terms of opening up to foreign investments since the Doi Moi reforms in 1986. You can have 100% foreign owned companies in the food and beverage space. Um, the only challenge is still a very bureaucratic environment and so the processes for establishing companies can take quite some time and involve a number of different steps. If I'm a business owner coming to Vietnam and I want to set up an F&B venue, what kind of gaps do you see in the market? Typically the, the local food and beverage scene has been either street food restaurants or the high end for the, you know, for the top 5% of the population and for you know, tourists and foreigners. But the gap in the market for locals, I think, remaining affordable while also um, improving things like food safety and food hygiene. There's been a number of cases in the media reported around contamination of food, which make people a little bit fearful of where their food comes from and what's in it. And so food safety has been a really big trend over the last few years. Came here rather than eating on the street, which is just really because uh, we thought it might be cleaner, everything outside is just laying out, it wasn't refrigerated. We don't know if it's healthy for us or not, for our stomachs. Yeah, the lids are and clean, so we will come back here. Our idea is to make like a modern street food. We know that in Vietnam, the best food that you eat is in the street. But sometimes it's not really uh, clean. clean. It's good, but maybe we won't return. 
so that's why we say that we need to do something good and clean. This is a very Hanoian kind of dish, and you're from Hanoi too. Yes. Why did you guys open here? The opportunity is bigger here um, than in Hanoi, and uh, you can start a business easier probably than uh, in Hanoi. Because maybe Hanoi people more maybe close their mind. Saigonese people are always up for new experiences, exactly. trying different things. Exactly. And... My parents always told me that people from the South when they have money, yeah. they spend, spend all, all of their money. Right, right. <laughs> and uh, and um, people from Manoy, they will keep their money. Here in our small kitchen to send uh, the spring room. Over there, we have the show kitchen. People, we love to, to see that. Oh. This is our the second one. We do another dish. Each restaurant do one dish. Did you want to open the second location so close? Because this one the price is really cheap. Uh. So we said we need to do it now before we will lose this opportunity. This is really good, by the way. Like, very good price. I think you guys selling it a little bit too cheap. We want to try keep the the, the price. Uh, not so high, with a good quality. The meat that we use is Viet Gap certificate. We use a good oil. We don't use a glutamate. If we do the same street food like really in the street, I have no motivation. So we must to do several uh, baba, not only one, to really make money. If we have ten like this. It's, it's, really, it's probably really good. And how much money would you need to start a project? Like Baba, we really don't need a big investment for for startup. 20,000 US dollars to start a small business here. You see people spending hundreds of thousands of dollars too though, right? Yeah. Of course. Big business, big money. Small business, small money. The, the, always the same thing. Huh? If you have a good idea, if you work hard, the people here are ready to open a, a home and you can make money. One of the problems globally for Vietnamese cuisine is that its value perception has been low because the prices have always been low. A bowl of pho will never have the same price as a bowl of ramen, even though pho actually takes longer and is harder to cook. But we're starting to see the emergence of restaurant owners and operators actually making Vietnamese food a higher value product. That means placing it in different settings. Uh, that means putting a higher emphasis on service, on higher quality ingredients, elevating Vietnamese food. Historically, Vietnam has always been very dependent on trade and will continue to be, I think, for the foreseeable future. But at the same time, domestic consumption is increasing rapidly with the emergence of the middle class. And I think China saw that same kind of situation happen with all their industries centered on serving the world rather than China. Chinese policies are not focused on domestic consumption and they're seeing great success because of that. Vietnam is going through that same inflection point. It's very compelling. If you're looking into Vietnam now, I think the most exciting opportunities as a small time entrepreneur is something more traditional. So you can talk about manufacturing, 
food and beverage, uh, FMCG, fast moving consumer goods. If you're a foreign operator and your product has not been sold in Vietnam yet, it's probably one of the last markets left. Hello. Finally, you found me. Yeah. It wasn't too hard. A lot of good branding. This is one of the best places to have traffic. Maybe they walk past about seven, eight times, and they start, maybe they start to buy, start okay. to try. I don't really rent a place here. I do consignment. So it's an easy way for uh, startups like me. Low risk, uh, good for them, good for me. Win-win situation. How many boxes do you usually sell every month here? Oh, it depends. Uh, sometimes 30 boxes 30 per boxes. month. Okay. Sometimes 70. Mm. How did you end up in Vietnam from Singapore? We actually went um, China to actually take a look whether we should start in China. We also thought of Malaysia, but because of um, the population of Muslim, it's more, so we didn't actually want to start there. So the next three countries that we looked at is actually Vietnam, Cambodia, and Myanmar. Me and my partner actually went in first to Vietnam. We like the culture. We realized that there's a lot of construction going around. There's influx of capital flow from foreigners' investment into Vietnam. We think that, okay, Vietnam might be the next big thing. So we decided to base in Vietnam. Do Vietnamese people understand what barbecue pork is? Vietnamese, they eat a lot of pork and they eat a lot of barbecue. So technically, they eat a lot of barbecue pork, just maybe not my kind of barbecue yeah. pork. So the main ingredient is actually fish sauce. Wow, Yeah, okay. because I mean, that's what local people like. Yeah. yeah, that's the secret sauce. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So for Vietnamese. We're still trying to educate the locals on letting them try our product. My main income is actually through the restaurants and the pubs. Hey, bro. Hello, hello. Yo. Hi, Chris. This is Howard. This is Chris. Nice to meet you. Yep. Welcome to the side. He's the talented uh, chef over here that's actually in charge of uh, bringing my frozen product into life. What inspired you guys to start working together? We both like to eat, see, so look at our size. We actually went out for dinner. He introduced himself to be a chef. Okay. So I say, maybe we can do something fun to collaborate okay. my bakwa uh, and his expertise. Awesome. And that's why, pump, we are here. Cool. He will take this product and make it into something very different and very nice. Okay. This is tea time tofu with pork jerky. And this one, pork jerky bun. Currently, um, selling to pubs and restaurants, I'm probably the only one here. So which one do you think is going to be long-term the bigger business? The, the retail or the B2B business? I am hoping retail, actually. Higher margin, branding is better, scalability is higher. Did you face any challenges, regulations to set up? Starting up a business in Vietnam is uh, not as straightforward, I would say. There are quite a lot of grey areas, actually. You need to know the culture. They actually will want to know you first as a person, then business later. Just kind of sit down over a tea or a lunch yeah. or dinner and yeah. get Relation, to know Yes, relationship building, networking is actually very important. Mm. If I were to advise people coming to Vietnam, I would first say try to get someone uh, that you know, someone that you trust, uh, especially a local partner. A local partner may be able to help you solve a problem which takes maybe one day. Okay, but if let's say you are a foreigner, it may, take some, it may take a month or so to do so. So it sounds like you learned it the hard way. In Singapore, we call it a tuition fee. Yeah, so you pay money to get experience. Uh, this is something that uh, I would not suggest everyone to do it because it's actually very stressful. navigating what you call murky waters of Vietnamese business. I think uh, I've, I've over overcome a lot of those challenges now. A couple of investments I've made in Vietnam have turned out to be very bad because of the people that I trusted. Um, as an entrepreneur who's ready to do business, 
um, some people can take advantage of that and it's best to um, not get overly excited. I think get patient, be patient, and take your time to evaluate business opportunities. I understand how the government regulates the industries and provides support for these industries. Thì như vậy là chúng ta thấy chính phủ Việt Nam đã xác nhận định cái ngành công nghiệp chế biến lương thực thực phẩm là một trong những cái ngành ưu tiên được lựa chọn phát triển từ nay cho đến năm 2025. Cho nên các cái thực phẩm chế biến, thực phẩm đóng gói sẵn và cái thức uống có cái chất lượng cao thì đều là tăng trưởng đều đặn như cái năm 2018 riêng cái nhóm hàng lương thực thực phẩm đó là những cái tăng trưởng rất cao của các cái nhóm hàng này. Bên industry F&B có công ty nhiều Việt Nam mà công ty mạng nhật. Ví dụ như là Vinamilk, như là đường thành thành công, như là Vít Xăng, Cầu Tre. Thì vừa qua thì chúng ta đã chứng kiến những cái cuộc mua bán sát nhập của một số các các công ty lớn. Cái sự cạnh tranh này thì là phải nói là cũng rất là khốc liệt trên cái thị trường Việt Nam. Người trăm nước về người quốc tế muốn làm việc trong F&B trong Việt Nam muốn cần suy nghĩ gì? Thì phải nói như thế này. Việt Nam là một cái nước có cái nền nông nghiệp chủ lực và như vậy Việt Nam là có cái vùng nguyên liệu rất tốt cho cái ngành hàng chế biến này cho nên các cái doanh nghiệp Việt Nam các cái nhà đầu tư cần phải liên kết với những cái người nông dân với những cái người làm ra cái nguyên liệu để đặt những cái hàng cộng với cái đổi mới trong cái sản xuất hiện đại đổi mới thiết bị là sẽ tạo lên cái sự thành công cho những người tham gia sản xuất nhóm hàng này. Pomelo Peel from a company from Kangpo province. They take the also only the palm inside and then we can buy the peel outside from them. So a lot of the product that you're buying is material that they're not going to use anyways. Yes, we call this utilization of byproducts. This machine, we call it the bittering step. You wash to make it clean, but also you remove the bitterness to make it suitable to eat. Can we should, try it uh, yeah, yeah, you can try yeah. it. Still pretty bitter, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Maybe the first washing step, you need to do several steps like that. This machine is from our research, and the purpose is to reduce the bitterness, but also not to really break the slices. If you do it too hard, too much, it will break all the, the peel, and the, the product doesn't look nice. You're also still teaching at the university? Yeah, my main job is a uh, lecturer at the uh, Dong Lop University. Many of the people who work here are my students. Some do part-time job. How has that experience been going from a professor, a lifelong academic, to, to now a businessman? It was not really easy, of course. People like me who have a um, engineering minded. We focused on technology, science and so on. Sometimes we say, okay, what I'm making is very good for health. But then people don't like it because it doesn't taste good. 
So beginning, we also had issue with sale and because we, we were trained for processing, for research, not for selling. When you do research, it's more fundamental. Uh, you have to look deep inside, look what are components inside which are good for health. And how do you process it to keep part of it still inside the product and so on. It's not only like you slice it and you treat it a little bit, you wash it and uh, you add some uh, sugar. If doing like that, then actually many people can do it. You're creating a product that uh, there's a lot of research and science behind the process. How do you communicate that to the average consumer? We are like a small group. We don't have uh, enough like finance to do big marketing program. So we do small step by step. We do on Facebook and some website, but of course that would not reach a high number of people. But as long as they know and they taste and they will love, and then they will buy and introduce to friends. It take a long time because it's not like uh, consumption food like rice or drinks and, and so on. So this is more so, of a snack? Yeah, it's more like snack. So the total market is still small. Mm. Is there a growing demand for, from Vietnamese for these kind of snacks? Several years ago, most of the fruits are consumed fresh. But nowadays, people are like uh, busier and they are used to processed fruit. They start like changing a bit their eating habit. And the way we process is we try to modify minimally. We want to keep the nutrient in the product. This is passion fruit. Very fresh. Very fresh, uh, yeah. And this color is natural color from the fruit. Mm. We added a little bit acetic acid to make the pH lower so the color appear like this. So this color is not because of the food color. So now we are entering the packaging room. This is the final formula peel. Was there anything like it before in Vietnam? There was before a product from Thailand, but they made it thicker and they added quite a lot of uh, food colorant. It's quite green. The taste also not the same. So the way of work is the first appeal in Vietnam. Our direction is we want to introduce other countries as well. This is a new internal package. Here we put the Ho Chi Minh City um, illustration. Uh, and we, we put an introduction slide here about the city because when we make product, we want also to to let people know it's more from about Vietnam. Vietnam. And, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I see. Food and beverage is a very attractive industry for people to get into. It's a lot of hard work and requires a lot of capital expense at the beginning. But I think rather than just being an operator, serving the consumers directly, anything in parallel to that space, like distributors, suppliers, technology providers, is very exciting. Not a lot of those things have been fully addressed yet, and there's a lot of innovation that can be done within that space. Camarillo, it's made a lot of noise in Vietnam now. How you manage to gain traction so quickly? While I was working at the restaurant, so I realized there is a lot of problem in the restaurant business. The purchasing and sourcing for restaurant is super inefficient and time consuming. There is a lot of mistake. For suppliers, managing order is a nightmare. Like they get a lot of phone call every day, emails, a lot of viber, and the way the restaurant owner order to you is just like, a, hey, it's me. Uh, I just need a meat tomorrow, that's it. But you, you gotta ask a lot of questions. Who are you? Yes. Uh, how many kilo of meat, uh, which meat? 
and the way that your location, uh, I got a lot of uh, headache about it. So I want to solve my own problem and also like a problem of industry. There is a product market fit more inf important for B2B business. There is founder market fit, which means like founder understand how all the, uh, the party working in the industry and in the chain, supply chain. I can show you like how the uh, the platform looks like. So this is a list of suppliers you can find by the category easily. You can see like all the delivery information, contact information for negotiation about the price and the payment method. Wow, this is very intuitive. Um, great visuals. So how has the design evolved over time? I imagine in the beginning it was maybe not the prettiest, but now it's looking pretty good. When we uh, launch, we still have only MVP. Actually, it was uh, not good enough to show to many people. We did uh, the whole design renewal like, uh, back in like four or five months ago. And then we launched mobile app. One of our biggest mistakes was we started from web app. But most people in like kitchen and chef, uh, the service staff, they don't bring the PC to the restaurant. And after having the mobile app, uh, our traction is basically pick up. Seeing who are the most active suppliers and most active restaurants, how do you use that data to build your products? For the supplier side, we are still working on that. Buyer side, we can see a lot of data of the daily uh, activity. So if there is a, some buyer is not using platform, maybe there might be some bug or some problem with the system that we have to follow up. Technology can support maybe 70% problem, but still 30% we still need uh, the people to help a customer. Hi Tao. Hey, what's Good morning. Up? Nice yeah. to see you. Nice to see you. For... I'm double checking all the orders before I dispatched. When we fulfill the order, everyone wait very carefully and pick out like um, leaf by leaf, so make sure to make sure that all our clients get the best quality product. But still, like because this involves a lot of labor work, we make a lot of mistakes. One of our delivery guys just got back, now I have to dispatch. How quickly do you guys guarantee delivery usually? We need a one hour delivery window, okay. uh, which is really good because uh, most suppliers out there only have like three hour delivery window. And restaurants have to wait a long time before they can receive the product. From the farmer to a uh, restaurant, there is a usually like two or three middlemen to uh, collect the item and deliver it to Ho Chi Minh and set it into a, a smaller market. So the farmer sells the vegetable is surprisingly cheap. But the restaurant buy is usually like a two or three times more than the, what the farmer sells. You're so, breaking down the middleman. Yeah, and... so basically I want to restructure the, all the efficiency from farmer to restaurant. Uh, in the future, I want to increase uh, the f uh, income for the farmer and uh, decrease a little, about, little bit about the price for the restaurant side. I always like to say there's three different groups in Vietnam, locals and then foreigners, Viet Qs. Viet Q is a slang term for overseas Vietnamese, like myself. About five years ago, this whole trend of reverse migration started. People who leave a country for economic or personal reasons, they actually return for essentially the same reason. The opportunities economically are huge in a country like Vietnam. There's so many things have not been done or done well yet. If you bring back a certain skill set or ambition, there's a good chance with the right team and resources, you can actually execute that vision. I've been back to Hanoi almost 10 years. 
I had a colorful childhood and a young adult life all over the world, from Russia to Germany to uh, Taiwan and then Singapore. I came up with a cafe concept, which was my first F&B business, Cafe with a K. We got funded for over five million dollars, and that was quite a shock to the industry. Like, what? Who's this girl? We're like a first mover in the whole industry. Before that, no yeah. one was really paying attention. Nobody. Yeah, and it's unheard of that you know somebody not from the startup background would just suddenly get funded for a very brick and mortar business. Nothing online. Nothing uh, related to e-commerce or you know mobile app. By the end of 2016, I just found that it was not for me any longer. So I stepped down. A lot of people um, wondered if I would start another F&B business, and I was hesitant to, to go into it again. But I did start consulting other people on uh, their own food businesses. on Chua Lang Street, and this is a popular hangout, dining, and uh, snacking area for Vietnamese students. And we are in Yutang Tea House, which is the first concept and brand that I created after Cafe. Over the past few years, there has been a strong surge of bubble tea joints opening, like mushrooms. What sets Yutang apart is that we have a food menu. So often, people like to snack together with a tea, or they can come for lunch and dinner. Until today, I think Yutang stands on its own in Vietnam, despite many other brands in Taiwanese bubble tea. We're still the only dining concept that is specialized in Taiwanese food. Do you think something like this is uh, potentially a franchise opportunity? Mm, we have received a lot of inquiries. There's definitely a strong market in sub-franchising successful brands in the bigger cities of Vietnam, like in Hanoi and Ho Chi Minh City, into the smaller second-tier cities. Are we seeing any Vietnamese brands that are successful here in Vietnam going overseas? Sadly, not yet. Coffee like Chung Nguyen also tried to go overseas. We don't see them taking off, probably because there's still a big cultural gap between the overseas market and the Vietnamese companies. If they're not doing that right, then maybe it was just be forgotten uh, in a corner of a mall and then gradually losing money, they, they will have to shut it down. I've been to Singapore and I've been to places like uh, London, New York, and Vietnamese food is hugely popular and always perceived as the more healthy version of Asian food. But the people in Vietnam or business owners in Vietnam are not yet capitalizing on that. And those that did try, they probably just stick with a family style, traditional Vietnamese cooking, catering to local Vietnamese people in those markets. How about success with brands that are coming from overseas and finding franchise partners in Vietnam? Um, there are lots of franchises looking for Vietnamese businessmen, but the fee to buy any franchise, let's say a bubble tea franchise, considered already on the lower end of uh, franchise fees, but it will still cost at least $20,000. And then you have to spend more money buying the ingredients. Before you even start to physically set up your outlet, you're already down maybe 50000 And to set up a physical restaurant or cafe, it will cost you at least another hundred dollars to $150,000. So, of course, it's cheaper if you do everything yourself and from scratch. People in the food scene in Vietnam are still 
more focus on the short-term gains and goals and that's why many of them still shy away from buying franchises and just want to either copy or just do something on their own. F&B turnover rate in Vietnam is very quick because people are not opening long-standing successful brands and they just keep trying to spin uh, their own brands. Vietnam is in that phase now where the emergence of foreign brands will continue to dominate the food and beverage industry. And I think local brands will continue to innovate as a result. They don't want their, the foreign brands to be eating their lunch. So I think this increased competition at the end of the day is good for Vietnam. It'll provide opportunity that is not there currently, such as wage growth and training and systems and processes. Have a seat, Hal. Beer we have here is probably the most synonymous beer with Hanoi because it's called Hanoi beer. Business is a little bit warm. It is yeah. warm, um, but the ice quickly cools it. It's a part of the beer drinking experience. So uh, how did you guys end up meeting and starting this whole tour business together? 2016, we, we were having a conversation about a, a tour idea to do in Hanoi together. At the time, food was starting to become popular. And Tan said, well, why don't we look at food? And, and I'm a beer lover, and Tan enjoyed a beer. Why don't we go for a beer angle? And how much money do you guys need to start a business like this? Oh. The setup costs <laughs> Nothing are quite modest. We have no physical space. It's reliant on bikes, it's reliant on drivers. Mainly we recruit you know, the driver, they are the student, you know. We're selling an experience really. At the end of the day, it's an experience. This type of beer that we're going to have is actually what is called beer hoy okay. or fresh beer. Hi, ba, ba zo. Okay. Oh, you see that? It tastes like water beer. almost. <laughs> Light, um, feathery lager, cheap. but easy to drink. Cheap beers and very easy to find them. Yeah. People finish works about like 5, 5.30, and then four or five men sit down and have a, uh, maybe four or five glass of beer before and talk and share everything to each other as well. So, when, so it's when like a social thing beer. For, for guys to go out and <laughs> drink together. And yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like, shh, shh, shh. <laughs> it's like we call, we call chem zhao, right? Yeah. You understand about that yeah. one? And if you look around at the moment, it's, it's still pretty much men that come to these houses. But Vietnam is definitely evolving, so yeah, it's abilities of local craft beer makers to add different local ingredients, like some fruits, etc., to beer. It's changed the taste profile of beer in Vietnam. And now the younger Vietnamese, when they're going out, both men and women sit together to drink, enjoy a beer. Welcome to our brewery. This is the brewing system. The capacity about 2,000 liters 2000. per bite. Here we can put inside some hop to get more aroma of the beer, right? Sometimes you can put some local Vietnamese ingredient, a ginger or cinnamon for secondary fermentation. You can test this one. Yeah. And you can feel different, right? Because the beer with nature mm. of the herb Vietnam. We use uh, red beetroot. Is there and even a word for craft beer in Vietnamese? We, we use something like beer thủ công, right? Okay. Craft beer, beer thủ công. Mm. But the people think beer thủ công is something like beer hơi. Mm. When I started, about uh, uh, four years ago, I have to stand there and explain for everyone. Mm. 
please test our beers. It's a different, this is more interesting. But I see now the trend go up very fast. Have you guys had a lot of challenges keeping your raw ingredients safe and clean? Yeah, this is a big challenge because in the tropical climate, right, a lot of insects. In the end, we buy two containers okay. to keep the raw material because the container is very close. Yeah, the insect cannot come inside, especially the mouth. This is from ballet. Huh? Moon from ballet. This one from wheat. They're yeah. different. This one more uh, soft, uh, right? And here more harder. Huh? And the aroma also different. Mm. Yeah. We use a different raw material for different kind of beer. Do you ever mix these two as well? Sometimes we mix this, depend on what type of the beer. Would you like the light one or this one? I like this one more. Okay, this yeah. one we call wheat. Wheat. And, and this is what the one used for the... Wheat beer. And this is for diners. These are more pizza. Okay. How much money do you need to start a craft beer business in Vietnam? Okay, for first step, small batch, some thousand USD. But if you grow, we need more and more, maybe some hundred thousand USD. And if you, you know, would like to have more capacity? Millions. And then millions. Just keep going, yeah. yeah. One very famous guy from US, he shared 10 years for the payback. You need to think about long term. Crop here in Vietnam now very small, about 0.01% only. A lot of opportunity for brands or boys because the market big. If you can produce good, high quality product, you can get success. Our target is the best crop beer in Vietnam, maybe in China. Kung at Seabrewmaster. He's creating a product that is innovative in a space that has not seen disruption for decades. I'm a big fan of that. If we look at the Hanoi Beer Tour guys, I think providing a solution for travelers uh, in a market that's growing very fast, that is a very exciting opportunity to be in. The opportunities in Vietnam are still plentiful. It's quite easy to do the kind of smash and grab business in Vietnam, but that window of opportunity is starting to narrow and close. A lot of businesses, and too many of them, are going for Saigon and Hanoi. The kind of demographics that have been left behind are the ones in the second tier cities. I think opening there makes more sense long term because the rising middle class are there and they're hungry for those experiences, but none exist in those second tier cities. And I think that's a bigger market to go after rather than just the market that's making the bigger dollars now.